Hey everyone, thank you for clicking on this video. My name is Justin and today I wanted to offer a bit of a different approach as to how we can take a look at the Toronto Maple Leafs and maybe some solutions looking at not so much the right now, but a little bit further in the future. Like many people, I've been of the mindset that, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs are not going to be able to succeed with the contracts that they have with Matthews, Marner, Tavares, Nylander, consuming 50% of the salary cap. And maybe the salary cap goes up in the next couple of years, but it's not looking lightly. And with that said, you know, I don't think that they are capable to move money around efficiently enough to make a strong enough team to go far enough in the playoffs and win a Stanley Cup. Their bottom six, their defensive groups, they've taken a hit because of those four contracts. And I think that obviously we've been looking at if the Leafs don't have success this following year, uh, those four guys are going to be split up and there are going to be massive changes to this team. However, I have said this in the videos in the past, I will say it again, I'm going to reiterate it. These four players, as far as personnel and skill and individual assets are not the issue. It is purely, simply the contracts. It is the way that the money is distributed around this team. Those four players are extremely talented. Three of them are so young and going into the prime of their career. Even John Tavares, who's getting up there, is such a skilled and valuable player and piece for this team. Those guys are not an issue. They truly are not. People are blaming Mitch Marner for last year's performance. That's because of how much he was getting paid. He was still a great player for us. It's just we have expectations that are through the roof because he's getting paid $10.9 million. And with that said, it's important for us to realize that all four of those players, their contracts are expiring in the next four years. Matthews and Nylander are up in three years. Tavares and Marner are up in four. And if we were to wait until after next season's results, if we don't make it to the playoffs, or if we make it to the playoffs and get out in the first round and everybody's up in arms again, we're looking at making a move when these players are two and three years away from free agency. And I think that that is a distinct, important piece that we have to consider as far as moves to make in the future. Let's say the solution is that, you know, Leafs don't make it out of the first round again next year and everybody goes, okay, Mitch Marner needs to get traded. Well, okay, first of all, you're not getting a player better than Mitch Marner. You might be able to manage your assets and your money a little bit better because you relieve yourself of that contract, but you are not getting a better player than Mitch Marner. He is a top winger in this league. You are not getting a winger that is going to be better. So you have to remove that from your mindset. You might again think that, okay, you're going to take that $10.9 million and just distribute it around your lineup a little bit better. But it's hard to tell if that actually t makes your team that much better for next year, where you can potentially win a Stanley Cup in two years. Not to mention the fact that Austin Matthews, it's been widely regarded as, you know, a big concern of Leafs fans that he might consider moving on from the Toronto Maple Leafs in free agency to go to his hometown and play in Arizona or anywhere else for that matter, considering that they haven't had success in the playoffs here. And do you really think that moving Mitch Marner next year when Matthews is only two years away from his free agency is the move to make to show Matthews, hey, we want you to stay here and win a cup with us? I don't think that makes sense as a recipe either. I think that he would look at that as, okay, well, our team is worse today than it was yesterday. I don't feel like I can win here. And I've got a real opportunity to make even more money in Arizona. I think I'm going to go do that. I'm not saying that's his mindset, but it's something you might have to consider. I don't think that you should really have to break the barriers down if those contracts are expiring soon. It's not like there's seven year deals that we just finished year one. These are coming up to a close. By this point, I am sure, I mean, I don't know them. I don't know what they're thinking, but I'm sure that the players are starting to understand that the team cannot succeed with the contracts that they have. Again, I think that they're happy with playing in Toronto. I think they're happy with playing with each other. And I think they truly do want to win here. I think Mitch Marner, part of the reason why he struggled in the playoffs is because he wants it so bad. He put a ton of pressure on himself and just choked. But I think these players truly want to be here and win here. And with that said, I think in three or four years, those contracts are a real opportunity for those players to show that they are dedicated to playing in Toronto and winning in Toronto and setting a new contract that is an appropriate number. Now, I'm not talking about taking a massive pay cut. I don't expect Mitch Marner, Austin Matthews to all of a sudden come out and take a huge discount because they say, I want to win here, I want to play here. But maybe 
look at some other individuals around the market, find even more fair market value, and try to compensate a little bit with that. Let's say Mitch Marner, instead of getting 10.9 on his next contract, maybe he settles for 9.5. It doesn't sound like a massive difference, and honestly, it's not. If you're looking from Mitch Marner's perspective, you're still getting your market value for a winger in this league, especially one that hasn't won a playoff series yet, and you are saving a million, close to $2 million on the salary cap for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And if you were to get that out of each of the four players, or even just out of one or two, you are getting enough money that the Toronto Maple Leafs can make appropriate moves, get better assets and the depth in their lineup, get better players instead of trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel in free agency and trade your big assets to get some players at more value. You won't have to do that as much and I think it prepares the team obviously better to win the championship that they're looking for if they've got a little bit less on those contracts. Again, Austin Matthews, he's at I think $11.834 million. What if on his next contract he takes 10.5? He's still getting I think appropriate market value for what he provides. Obviously, he's probably a top three, maybe top five player in this league so he deserves all the money he wants. But if he takes $1 million less than what he's making now, it makes the Toronto Maple Leafs that much closer to winning their cup. These players already got their payday. And I'm not blaming Kyle Dubas for that either. Kyle Dubas was in a situation where all these restricted free agents coming out of their entry-level contracts were either looking at getting their payday or threatening to leave the team. And Kyle Dubas was in a lose-lose situation. He lets William Nylander sit out for half of the season and he looks like the villain because he doesn't get that signed. And then he signs these players to the contracts that they want and he looks like the villain because he overpays. What do you expect from him? Well, in the next three years, I think you can expect from him that he will negotiate these players down and say, why do you possibly deserve more money or equal money to what we gave you after your ELC, considering the fact that you haven't won anything? And this is under the assumption that in the next four years, the Toronto Maple Leafs don't win a cup and don't go on a deep stretch in the playoffs. Well, Kyle Dubas has all the leverage there. If the player ultimately wants to move, Kyle Dubas can make a deal and make that happen during their last year of their contract if it's evident that these players don't want to return. But even if they don't want to return, I don't think that the approach is to keep trying to win, depending on how many players are looking at leaving. I think the opportunity is there that you say, okay, look, we tried to make it work. You're not willing to negotiate here. You're not willing to look at this in a realistic fashion. We're going to let you leave. You're going to be public enemy number one here. Everybody in Leafs Nation is going to hate you. You had a real opportunity to win here in your hometown. If you're looking at the likes of Mitch Marner and John Tavares, see you never. Or make a deal. But, I mean, that's in the case that, you know, three years down the line, these players still aren't willing to negotiate down from their high numbers after they haven't won anything for years. And I think the big wild card here, and I honestly think this is the truth, is that John Tavares and his next contract is going to take a very fair number. And I think that's going to be a massive critical piece to the future here in Toronto. John Tavares leaves the uh, New York Islanders to come home in free agency to his hometown team, saying he wants to win here, becomes the captain. He's the face of the franchise, aside from obviously Austin Matthews. He is the guy that's like supposed to be the local hero. And I know that at this point of his career, he is just looking to win. He got his $11 million, which was already a pay cut, apparently, because I think San Jose was offering him $13 million in free agency. Took a little bit of a, uh, a pay cut. But this is an opportunity where we can see John Tavares maybe taking like seven or six million dollars on his next uh, on his next contract because John Tavares just wants to win and he wants to win here. I don't think there's any situation where John Tavares is looking at leaving again in free agency and going to another team. Maybe there is. I don't know. I don't know him personally, but I would have to assume that he's planning on finishing his career in Toronto. And that gives, again, all the leverage for Kyle Dubas to say, look, we want you here. We think you're so valuable. You are a captain, but we want you to win here and become that hero that you've been dreaming of since you were a kid pajama boy, right? So take a little bit less. And again, we're not talking about taking like a $5 million contract, but somewhere in the $7 million range, that saves you $4 million based on his last contract. That is important money that can then get moved around the team and make this team really competitive. So if you have that perspective that these players might be willing to take a little bit less on their contracts when their these contracts expire based on, you know, they've gotten a lot of heat. A lot of heat, especially the likes of like Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews and <laughs> William Nylander. They take so much heat because of their contracts. I would hope that these players are getting to the point where they're like, wow, it's just not worth the money. I want to play here and I want to win. 
I'll take a little bit less on my next deal. If that's the mindset, I think it's worth spending the next four years just trying to make it worth with the work with those big four contracts. I still don't think that it's a way to succeed in the next four years, but it's doable. You can try to get those value players around them, try to make it succeed. These players are close to getting there and getting the job done, even though they've still lost in the first round every year. They have extreme talent and they are so young. It would be really bad asset management to just give up on a player that's only 23 years of age and a top player in the NHL just because your team hasn't gotten it done. It's an opportunity for you to just work with your team, work with your assets and figure out a way to make it work. And with that said, if these players are on that mindset right now, let's say example, Mitch Marner having a really tough time after last year's loss, keeping it really hard on himself. Maybe Kyle Dubas should go up to him right now and say, here, we want to negotiate a contract to keep you in Toronto, but we want you to take a little bit less. Sign now for $9 million. Sign now for $9.5 million. That's going to be a good rate at that point. He's still going to be worth every dollar of that. And in fact, by the time that contract comes around in three or four years, maybe the salary cap has gone up and it's exponentially even more valuable. So maybe... Mitch Marner wants to take up, up on that deal and sign like, let's say an eight year deal. Who knows? I'm not a negotiator. I'm not a general manager. It's just a thought on how we can look at this team moving forward. With that said, I don't know what to believe anymore uh, with the appropriate way to handle this team. I really do believe in Kyle Dubas. I think that he's made all the right decisions up until this point. I know a lot of people disagree with that. I think Kyle Dubas has been fantastic and I would fully trust Kyle Dubas in a full rebuild as well. If the Leafs were to ultimately lose again and decide we're gonna blow this team up, I would put all my faith in Kyle Dubas because I think he's done a really good job up until this point. He's just been new into the league and needs to learn from some lessons like signing those contracts that he did. I think he's obviously learned from those and he will be an excellent general manager to make sure that this team becomes successful in the future. So I believe in him. I believe in whatever way he's looking at this team. I happen to think he is looking the way that, you know, I went over it today, where he sees these players as really, really, really talented top players in the league at only 22, 23 years of age. And he's not willing to move any of those players for any reason. He's just willing to negotiate and make it work in the long term to keep them here. And I think that's the right way to do it. I've been adamant up until this point that saying like, you know, if this doesn't work next season, you got to make big changes. I think I might have talked myself out of it. I really do think that these players are the right players for this team. Again, I just think that the contracts are not the right contracts. And I think that if you were looking at it like these guys are at new contracts in four years, it's an opportunity to work with what you've got. Take advantage of the fact that they haven't won anything. You've got all the leverage, negotiate them down, keep them here, but at a better number that allows you to round out the rest of the lineup and hopefully make a successful team that can win a cup in the near future. Let me know your thoughts on what I presented today. Do you think that it's time to get rid of these players and make a big change? Do you think it's worth waiting it out four years with the obviously talented team that we have? We came first in the North Division that, uh, last year, and I think that we're still a top team in this league. We can still continue to try to compete with this core for the next four years and then deal with it when those contracts expire. Do you think that's the right course of action? Tell me what you think. I'd love to hear it. We're getting really close to the season. I cannot wait. I think that this year will be an exciting season. Obviously, it's going to be a very difficult season as well. I'll be making some videos just more about the general NHL and coming up with this season. So stay tuned for that. And in the meantime, if you do like my content, click like, click subscribe. I look forward to reading your comments and I'll see you in the next video.